but um, I just checked and I saw that I didn't cover that. And that is mediation. Can you all hear me? I'm just going to continue until somebody complains. Yes, so, we uh, can. We can. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right. So mediation. Um, what is mediation? That is the question that you would ask me if you don't know what mediation is. It is a voluntary process which requires um, that both parties consent to mediation. Right? And what a mediator does, it assists the parties in the actual litigation or in potential litigation by facilitating um, discussions, assisting the parties in identifying what is in issue, what are the disputes between them, and also by clarifying certain priorities and, and, and looking at areas of compromise and also generating options um, to resolve the dispute. Those of you who have attended the CCMA who have knowledge of it knows that that is what happens at, at, media, at the mediation stage of, of the CCMA. Right, so um, depending of, of whether you are can force a party to, me to mediate, that depends. If the parties have entered into a contract, into an agreement, and in terms of the agreement they've agreed to mediate, then obviously in terms of the contract, you are bound to, to mediate. But ca can you be forced to mediate in terms of the court rules? Now, recently, and when I say recently, I mean 2019, which seems like yesterday, there was an um, amendment, um, a Rule 41 capital A. That is the rule in the High Court rules that deals with, with mediation. So if the contract doesn't talk anything about mediation or there was no contract, the cause of action on which the claim or the case is based is not based on contract. You are required in terms of Rule 41A to at least consider mediation. What Rule 41 capital A says, um, it defines a dispute as meaning the subject matter of litigation between the parties or an aspect thereof and Rule 41A requires that every new action or application must be accompanied by a notice. And that notice must be delivered by a plaintiff or an applicant, depending on the proceedings, together with a summons or notice of motion, and by a defendant or a respondent with a plea or answering affidavit indicating whether the party agrees to or opposes the referral to, to the district for mediation. Now, this form um, that you have to complete is also part of the uniform rules. Yes, there's a disturbance. Can you just put um, mute your microphone, please? This form is form 27 of the uniform rules that you have to complete and therein you have to indicate um, whether you, you are open to consider mediation to resolve the dispute. Right, so um, you are, you, you're not forced to mediate. What the rule does, the High Court rule does, is the rule says you have to at least consider it, and then the court knows that you've at least considered it. Now, this document of whether, what your attitude towards mediation was, this, this doesn't form part of the court file, so the court is not privy to whether you wanted to mediate and your opponent didn't want to mediate. That is, uh, it's without prejudice. Okay, um, do we do I have any questions on mediation? That's basically all that I can tell you about mediation at this stage. It's just that you have to consider it. Um, oh, and the mediator, you, um, you, you have to appoint a mediator together, the two parties, and obviously there are costs involved because you are going to carry the cost of paying that mediator for mediating. Um, yeah, that is that 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 is what happens when you decide to mediate. OK, um, are there any questions on mediation? None? OK, I'm going I'm going on. Yes, 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 Tap Hedy. Yes. I just want to check uh, because uh, in your special plea, you have got arbitration. So if the mediation from part of the contract, can it be erased as, uh, as yes. a special plea? 
yes, yes, it can also be raised that the parties have agreed to mediate and arbitrate before they go to court. Yes, thank you very much. You thank can you. also raise that, and if if that hasn't been complied with, then the the summons is premature because you've previously agreed to how you're going to try and settle disputes. Yes, thank you very much, Advocate. Pleasure. Any other questions? None. OK, so just remember when you issue summons or an application, you have to file the form 27 and, and you have to indicate whether you are open to mediation and just look at the, the consequences of that. Costs involved, can your client really afford to mediate? Because that is that was my initial question. Um, it's, it's good and fine to say that parties must consider mediation, but can everybody afford to pay a mediator? When we go to court the judge, we don't pay the judge. We, we pay our lawyers, but we are still going to have lawyers at the mediation process. So it's a, it is something to consider. Um, yeah, but you're not forced. Yes, Luther. May, you may ask Luther. Oh, was that a mistake? Evening, Council. Good evening. Yes. Um. Since you 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 saying um, the question is that whether can you afford it, but now in in certain contracts, like for in the co construction law contract, yes, uh, mediation, no arbitration, adjudication. I mean, is normally a requirement in those contracts. Yes. No, that now, is that is if, part of that if, contract. Yes. Yes. Then, but now, if let's say, for example, uh, at that stage where you 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 raise a dispute, you can't actually afford uh, uh, an adjudication process. Then what then? But you you are contractually bound to do that because you have entered into an agreement. If you if you have entered into an agreement that that is going to be considered if a dispute should arise between the parties, then that is the way that you have to go. There's no way out of that. Out of that. If you, uh, I'm talking about generally, it is now required that you must. Um, generally, it is now required that you must um, uh, consider mediation and you must inform. You must you must file a notice to tell the other party. I'm considered I'm open to mediation or I, I don't think this matter can be resolved by mediation. That is now without having agreed in a contract before. But if you are contractually bound, there's no way out of that. I'm just okay. telling you about the rule that has now been promulgated since 2019. You have to indicate that you have considered mediation at least. You're not forced to mediate, but it is a consideration and you have to then state, look, I want to mediate or I don't want to mediate. Okay, understood. Thank you, Council. Okay, no problem. Yes. It is important for you to also understand that the mediator does not make a finding or a decision regarding the outcome of the matter. Right? Um, the met this method that he um that he a mediator uses, the parties are still in control of the matter in which the dispute is resolved. So um, the mediator will just try and find compromises and try and, and guide people in the right direction so that they can come to an agreement because they are still in control. That is that is what mediation is. Right? Unlike arbitration, when there's an arbitrator who will make a decision after hearing evidence, the mediator is more or less mediating between two parties and have a dispute and trying to solve that. OK. Right. Um, going on. Um, Right, I said last night that I was going to answer the question. Was it Bontley? Bontley, was it you? Are you here? Bontley, Bontley. Sorry if I'm not saying your name correctly. If you're not here, then I'm not going to deal with it. I want you to be here because it was your question. Okay, I'm just going to continue. Um, am I sharing my screen with you, my, um, people? Am I sharing my screen? Can somebody just indicate? Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes. Okay, yes. thank you. Okay, so we ended last night with special plea. Is if Bontley comes later on, um, she had the question about oh. decision. I will deal with that when she's here. Sorry, okay. Yes, um, yes, just sir. Just put it on a slide on a on a presentation mode, please. Is uh, it not? Is it not? 
Thank you. Advocate. Yes. Yes, I just wanted to uh, uh, to get clarity. Let's say, for instance, the parties agree to mediation, but uh, when they they are mediating their uh, 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 dispute, it, it it transpires that they cannot settle the entire dispute, but they manage to settle part of the dispute and they fail to settle the other part of the dispute. Can then the <clears throat> unresolved dispute be taken for litigation or what will be uh, 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 the solution around that? Yes, usually that is what happens. Look, if you can settle part of the disputes um, and you in agreement that only a certain part needs to be litigated on, that, that will... Um, the purpose of mediation would have been partly reached because part of the matter has been solved outside of court because litigation is expensive and that is why they have this um, mediation and they say it's not expensive, but yeah. So yes, you can go to court to answer your question. You can, can go to court on, on a narrower issue than what the initial issue between the two parties were. Oh, you thank you, Councillor. No problem. Okay. Yes. So we, we were busy with the pleas. Remember, um, we did the plea um, and the pleas are dealt with in terms of rule 22 of the uniform rules, right? And I said that you can raise a special plea if there are grounds to raise a special plea. Then these are the special pleas. The delay to the special pleas just delay the proceedings. It doesn't bring an end to it. Whereas special pleas in abatement would bring an end to the litigate to that litigation between those two parties. Right. So going on, pleading on the merits. Now remember, it is the defendant who files a plea. Now the rule says to each and every allegation in the plaintiff's particulars of claim or declaration, the defendant must plea. If he does not, if he leaves out one of the allegations, he is deemed to have admitted it. So you must deal with each and every allegation, right? So if not admitted or denied, it will be deemed to be admitted. Now the rule says that you can do one of the following in a plea. You can admit, when you say yes, this is true. You can deny when you say no, that is not true. And then you would obviously give your side of the story why you say it's not true. And then there's the third one you can confess and avoid. You can say yes, but. Now, for those of you in practice, you must have seen, I'm, I'm, I'm also guilty of it. We sometimes say the content of this paragraph is noted. That is actually an admission, but because of the, the way the particulars of claim is framed, they may be referred to a document that is attached or to something that you, 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 you do not denying, but you don't want to say you admitted, then you say you're noting it. That actually means it is admitted because there's nothing as noted in terms of the rules, right? So it's admit, deny, confess, and avoid. Remember I said the two most important pleadings where we can see what the parties are fighting about is the particulars of claim and the plea. Now, those two will tell us. Remember, now we have the plaintiff who stated his or her case set out. Now it's time for the defendant to say what he agrees with and what not. So everything that is going to admit that we say is not in dispute because we are in agreement on those issues. This is what the defendant agrees with the plaintiff on. We also refer to it as common cause issues. The plaintiff don't have to prove that because the defendant says, yes, I agree with you, that's true. So the only, um, and, and here we see what we are fighting about is actually that that is denied or confess and avoid if we don't um, agree with how, when you say yes, but this is the reason. Okay, so I don't know how um how this was told to you in, in, in another cause maybe, but this is how I'm going to deal with it, right? I'm going to have an example of each and every one of this, like admit, deny, and confess and avoid. Now, um, there is no right way 
of no, no one way of drafting. There are many ways of drafting. It is a matter of style. So you might do it one way and another person do it another way, as long as you admit, deny, confess and avoid. So I have a few examples. I'm first going to start with an admission and how you deal with an admission, right? So an admission is when you agree. Say, for example, the particulars of claim in paragraph three said that the defendant was at all material times the registered owner of, a, of an immovable property described as Earth 1 to 3 Cape Town. And then uh, paragraph four, the defendant is in occupation of the property. Those two paragraphs follow each other. And I've specifically used this example because we're going to admit both of that. And why I used the, the two, the, this in this example is because I want to illustrate to you that there's going to be more than one paragraph that you're going to admit. But don't now go and choose all the paragraphs that you admit, like two, three, 10, 15, whatever, and then say, this is what I admit. Do it consecutively and you can group it together if it follows one another. Remember, I said to you that rule 18 says that you must number the paragraphs and here is why you have to number the paragraphs. Right, so in the plea, the defendant will do this. He will say at paragraphs three and four thereof. He may just say paragraph three, paragraph three, and he can follow it with paragraph four, or he can say paragraphs three and four, or at. At is Latin, it means two. Two paragraphs, three and four, this is what I say. Right, now I said this is an admission. So what the defendant does, he just says the defendant admits these paragraphs. So now we know that is not in dispute. Nobody has to prove that. No witness must come and testify that. Those are common cause issues, right? Very straightforward. A denial, this is when the defendant disagrees with the plaintiff, right? Say, for example, the particulars of claim said something like the following. On 12 August 2019, the defendant caused to be published defamatory matter of and concerning the plaintiff in an article in Cape Argus, a daily newspaper circulating in the Western Cape. A copy of the article is annexed marked A. Right, so the plea to paragraph three, and remember you also number your paragraphs in the, in the plea. It's not necessarily going to be the same. This is just coincidental. So at paragraph three to paragraph three, this is what the defendant is saying the defendant denies that he published the article and that it is defamatory of the plaintiff. And then he just adds this line, save as aforesaid, the defendant admits the rest of the allegations here. Once again, I've chosen this um, to illustrate that we're not putting everything in that paragraph in dispute. The, what we're not putting in dispute is the fact that there's a daily newspaper called the Cape Argus that circulates in the Western Cape. So the, if we put that in dispute, it would mean that the plaintiff will now have to go call somebody who's going to say, yes, there's a daily newspaper, it's called the Cape Argus and it circulates in the Western Cape. That is not in dispute. So we say, we only dispute that the article was published and it is defamatory, but the rest we admit. Okay, and like I say, it's a matter of style. You you have looked at at a lot of pleadings, I, I presume, and you will see that people do it differently as long as the message is across. There's no right or wrong way as long as you say what you need to say and it's understood. Right, C confess and avoid. Now, this is when the plaintiff says, yes, that is true what you're saying, but I have a reason for that. Like, for example, the particulars of claim paragraph four says on 3 March 2018, the defendant unlawfully arrested the plaintiff in Cape Town. Right, the plea, paragraph three of the plea speaks to paragraph four. It says at paragraph four, the defendant admits that on 3 March 2018, that is the confession, and at Cape Town, he arrested the plaintiff. And here comes the but. But he denies that the arrest was unlawful by virtue of the following facts and circumstances. And here is also an instance where you would use subparagraphs. So that is three. So 3.1, you would now say why the arrest was lawful. 
the defendant was a peace officer on the date and the time the crime was committed in the prisons. And in terms of that um, statute and sections of that statute, the arrest was lawful. Right, so that is confess and avoid. Right now, sometimes you do not know. Now, I've said if you leave something out, it is deemed to be an admission. So how do you deal with something that you don't know? Right, you plead a non-admission. So if you are not able to do any of the above example due to the lack of information, you can plead a non-admission. Now, I don't have the non-admission typed out here. I will tell you what it says. You would usually say the defendant have no knowledge of the allegations in this paragraph. Therefore, he cannot admit or deny it, and it puts the plaintiff to the proof thereof. It goes something like that. Okay, so... I don't know what you're talking about. I cannot admit it. I cannot deny it. You must prove that. So he didn't leave it out. He dealt with it, but it's a non-admission. Now, there is some debate in some circles that you should never plead a non-admission. You should rather deny if you don't know. Um, you may know that we also always have the, the remedy of amending our pleas. So if something should come to the defendant's notice later on, we has knowledge and we now can say whether he admits or deny. He can always amend his plea, right? Because if you do not amend your plea, remember if you say in your plea that you don't know anything about that, that is now the facts because in the pleadings you have the facts. In the particulars of claim and the plea, we establish the facts. Now comes to the trial, you suddenly have a witness who's now going to deny that specific fact. Whereas in your pleadings, you have indicated you have no knowledge. You're going to be in trouble with the court because remember, the plaintiff relies on what you are pleading and that is the facts. So if he knew that you now are going to deny that, he would have had to prepare adequately to counter that. Now, he didn't because you didn't tell him and, and he can ask for a postponement, baby, and if the court granted, you will be liable for any wasted costs. So just be careful. When things come to the fore and to your attention, please write about it immediately. Do the amendment immediately. It happens sometimes because you have only 20 days after the notice of intention to defend to file your plea that you don't have all the information. And this I see always um, where the government is the um, is the defendant. They they don't find the policeman who did the arrest. They don't find the doctors and the nurses in time to consult with them and to take full particulars. So they will they will do non admissions because they have no knowledge. But later on whilst they are preparing for the matter, these things become clear and they now know what their case is. So it is incumbent on them then to inform the opponent so that the opponent know what is their views on that and prepare adequately. Because in South Africa, we don't have um, surprise, the element of surprise in litigation. You know all along and you should know what, what your opponent's case is and what your case, you should know what your case is and, and, and so forth. Right, so remember, this is just a note, even if you raise a special plea, you will always plead over on the merits. So even if you're going to raise a special plea, for example, of prescription, and you in your heart of heart thinks I'm going to succeed because this claim has prescribed, therefore I'm not even going to bother with the merits. The chance is that your opponent may, the plaintiff may, Convince the court that the matter did not prescribe. And then where are you? Then you are deemed to have admitted everything else. So be careful. Even if you raise a special plea, still plead over the merits. And you do it in one document. It's not a special plea document. And you do your plea and then you will say special plea. That's if you have a special plea. And you will say what your special plea is. And then you will start. Um, addressing the merits. In applications, if you have a, a special plea as such, um, 
remember the application is it, it's an affidavit that is deposed to by somebody with personal knowledge. You can um, raise a point in limine. They don't call it special plea. They call it point in limine. That is now before you deal with the merits. And there you can also say somebody should have been joined is not joined or whatever um, the special plea is, but it's dealt with in terms of a point in limine. Right, so if you're going to brief counsel to draft a, a plea, then in the case of the combined summons, a copy must be in the brief as well as um, particulars of claim, the summons, uh, full instructions with regarding to the defence, copies of all the documents relevant to the defendant's defence, and statements taken by by witnesses, taken by the attorney from witnesses. Okay. Um, do I have any questions on plea? Yes. Oh, I see some questions. Can you? You can ask. Um, Opa, Fala. You must. Uh, you must unmute first. Advocate, my apology. Uh, I forgot to uh, lower my hand because I asked a question regarding mediation earlier on. Oh, okay. Okay. My no apology. Problem. No problem. Right, Hassan. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so, uh, Council, if you could just go back a few slides to where you explained the denial. Okay, let me just. Um, sorry. Um, the denial. You have it? Yeah. Uh, yes. OK, now. Isn't. Isn't this a conf, uh, confess and avoidance because you are confessing to certain parts of the claim and you are not to are you admitting certain parts of the claim and you are not admitting any other uh, part of the claim? So um, what what is common? I see in. Uh, what in are you admitting? The fact that there's a, a newspaper called the Argus. Yeah, let, let's that say. Is, yeah. Yeah, let's say let, let, let's just read this again. Defendant calls to be published defamatory matter. Uh, yeah, let, let's say. He did publish something in the Argus. But he denies that it's defamatory. Yeah, but he de so, he's, he's even denying that he published something. In my example, I hear where you're going, but yeah. it doesn't suit uh, my example. My example says he denies that he published anything and that it is de defamatory. Yeah, yeah, your, your example is, is perfect, is 100%. But uh, let's say in a case where he did publish something, but he denies it is That's defamatory. defamatory. So, okay. uh, so is that is that then a confess and denial? That would be confess. Uh, sorry, confess and he avoidance. published he published information, but he denies it is defamatory, and then he will say for the following reasons, and then what is the justification for publishing information? It is in public interest. It is the truth. All of those. Then he can then you could do that. Yes. In the in all right. The, yeah. You could. All right. And and what's common? What's common in uh, lots of these uh, pleadings? is the following statement, and you've got it in um, on, on page 120, uh, the paragraph on top, the first paragraph. Yes. Is, save as aforesaid, the defendant denies each and every allegation herein contained as if specifically traversed. Yeah. Can you just explain what that means? I mean, that's actually a common... Uh, you see it commonly. They try to tell people that um, you must stay away from that. You say on what page? 120. It's page 120. Uh, the first paragraph, last sentence. Oh, save as a force that the defendant denies each and every allegations here and contained as we specifically traverse. As if you have dealt with each and every allegation specifically, without uh, specifically it, dealing with it. That's what it means. Go traverse it, means going over it. Yeah. Yes. So so that, so that's what it means. Um, are you covering yourself here? You say you deny everything that is said there. Specifically, each and every allegation, not just yeah, not just one, but one of it, um, everyone. 
so is that is that good drafting practice to have something like that in your yeah they say in, that you you should try that the, look this is all part of i think legalese because as if specifically to reverse people still do it like i say it's a matter of style you don't but, have to if you're not comfortable in it you can deal with each and every aspect and then just say you deny 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 or you can say uh, um to shorten it as if specifically traversed yeah i don't know if All i'm right. answering you sufficiently you, but that is just me. my you've take on it yes you've answered me thank you so much okay okay thank you sir any other questions i just want to check if there are hands no no other hands Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes. um, I want to understand uh, the simple one. This AD, what does it mean? Supposed to mean? It's Latin. It means two. Two, this Correct? paragraph, two, two. T O. T O, okay. not, not the number, not the numeral two. The uh, two. Two, paragraph one. This is what okay. I say. Two, it's Latin. All right. Add. It means two. Okay, okay. You don't have to put it there, but you will see in many. It says at paragraph one. It means two paragraph yep. one. This is what the defendant says. Okay. Okay. Anything else? Right. Let's then move on. Right. So now I'm going to deal with. Um, de defective pleadings. I think one of the textbooks mentioned the defective pleadings. Your notes don't mention it as defective pleadings, but I thought that was an apt way of describing pleadings that has certain mistakes in it. Right. So the main pleadings to be scrutinized to ensure that they are not defective are the plaintiff's particulars of claim or declaration and the defendant's plea. For those of you who are still wondering what declaration is, I, I explained to you the first night, but I will do it again. Remember, when a simple summons has been used, there's a summary of the cause of action. If the defendant says it's going to defend, the plaintiff must file a declaration. The declaration is exactly the same document as a particular soft claim where combined summons has been used. So um, the main, that is the main pleadings then, the particular soft claim or declaration and the defendant's plea. Right, that must be scrutinized to ensure that there's no defects. So when you receive a particular soft claim or a declaration or a plea from the other side, depending for whom you are acting, you must read it carefully to ensure that it is not effective. Right, so check for mistakes. And I'm not talking now about the merits of the matter. We're talking outside of the matter. And we're specifically dealing with exceptions and rule 23 is the relevant rule. Right. So when a pleading is vague and embarrassing, you can use this vehicle, the exception vehicle, right? So you're reading the, the pleading, it can, like I said, particulars of claim declaration and a plea, they are all pleadings. So a plea is also a pleading, right? But the pleading is not only a plea, a pleading can also be a particulars of claim and a declaration. So if it is vague and embarrassing, then before you raise the exception, you must send a notice to your opponent and ask them to remove the cause of the embarrassment before you take the, the exception. Right. If a pleading lacks an averment which are necessary either to sustain an action or to sustain a defence, you, you don't have to send them a notice and ask them to fix whatever is wrong. You can just take exception straight away. Right. That is in terms of rule 23.1. Are there any questions at this stage? No, right. When is an exception? Oh, they are. Sorry. Yes. Hi, uh, advocate. When you say a pleading is embarrassing, which, which to me is a, a subjective feeling one can feel, uh, how objectively will someone rule whether that indeed uh, must be vague and embarrassing? embarrassing? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. They use the two terms together. It is so vague that I'm going to be embarrassed if I'm going to plead to it.
for example, if you say the defendant was negligent, therefore I suffered damages. I don't know what you mean. What did I do? What didn't I do? Did I just wake up that morning and I'm negligent? That's, can you see the vagueness? You must say how I was negligent. I drove too fast. I jumped the robot. I, I didn't um, adhere to the rules of the road. I drove on the wrong side of the road. You must tell me how. So if you just say the defendant was negligent, I don't know what you're talking about. That's vague. And if I'm going to plead to that, I can embarrass myself because I don't know if you just said I, I was negligent because of the way. I don't know. Do you understand where that comes from? I do understand vague, but but I think when it someone says something is when someone says something is embarrassing, it could just be that they are overly sensitive. It's not necessarily embarrassing, but vague no. I can because no. vague is about meaning. I cannot plead to something I don't understand. But when somebody yeah, but says if you're something going is embarrassing, to plead to something, yeah, then you will be embarrassed because you might plead to the wrong thing because you didn't understand what you mean because of the vagueness. It becomes embarrassing to you. Okay, that's a matter of semantics, but because it is vague, it can cause embarrassment. Vague and embarrassing. It's vague, and if I'm going to plead, I really, I'm going to take a chance, and I'm going to guess what you mean. But I, I might be wrong, and then I might embarrass myself. I guess that's my understanding of vague and embarrassing. I don't know if anybody okay. wants to throw in. Yeah. Thanks so much. Okay. There's other hands. Zamu. Was that Zamu now? No. Um, Hassan, your hand is still up. Yeah, yeah, ma'am. If you can just go back to the previous slide or your slide 165. This one. Yeah. Yeah. I might have missed something. Uh, you indicated there are instances where a notice has to be sent prior to the pleading and uh, instances where a notice doesn't have to be sent. So it can be, uh, he can, your defendant, the defendant can plead an exception. Can you just uh, clarify those two instances? Okay, if it is vague and embarrassing, yeah. you must first send a notice and ask your opponent to remove the cause of the vagueness. Okay. He must now clear up what he means so that you All don't right. embarrass yourself. Right? So you're first giving them opportunity. Okay. If it lacks an averment that's necessary to sustain a cause of action, for example, it's based on Dili, but there's no causal link between the damages suffered and the act that the defendant committed. It lacks one of the averments that is necessary to sustain a cause of action. You don't have to send it, send him a notice to say fix that. You can just raise an exception straight away. All right. And now thanks for the clarification. So what is the consequence of raising an exception? Uh, I take it it's unlike a special plea like prescription where it, uh, where the matter just ends because of that. So the, does the it may end? It may end depending on on what happens in court at the exception because it's heard as an opposed motion. You go and you argue, and if the court um decides that look, this is, you don't have a case, there's no cause of action, then then the case may end. Can the plaintiff? Yes. Yeah. Uh, can, can the plaintiff rectify that and uh, and put in a cause of action in his uh uh. In what do you call it in his uh, replication? Well, not in the replication, but he could amend his particular self claim if the court allows him. And I, I will deal with how the court deals with exceptions right. on a, in a later slide. But you are on the right track. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any anyone else? Okay, we move ahead. Advocate. Oh yes, yes. Yes, advocate, I just wanted to touch on the vacant embarrassing uh, part, and I just think it is to do with that also in this is my view, obviously, that, you know, you know, the profession of, of, of the legal profession is sort of seen as a very high profession, you know, in terms of professionalism. And I think what would also be a good illustration where or of this, uh, the way we need to conduct ourselves. And, and that response that is vacant embarrassing for someone that has, you know, with that 
that supposed to be so knowledgeable and and the fact that this cases that we do that's in the media now where you where i'm sitting and you look you look we are uh, still busy with with uh, getting to be admitted as attorneys but the examples of just an example the sizua mayani case the way the, the the advocate you know those are the things and i think <laughs> but it's just my take advocate I'm, I'm you know you wonder is this is how you must is this the way you must act that like you are just a tortsy with a gown on and you just put there and say you know what just go and defend that person you know uh, really it, it it sort of raised questions i mean is this professional the way people are shouting shut up at each other uh, so I, uh, I think this vague and embarrassing to me that's to me that's basically you telling your opponent look you a learned person you know at least give me something to work with yeah yeah basically you're telling him give me more clarity because i don't know what you mean yeah okay thanks mr malchas anything else right so so yeah Right, so when would you raise an exception, the, t the time frame when you raise an exception? It depends for you appearing, right? If the excipient, now this is the person who raises the exception. That person is referred to as the excipient because remember it can be either the plaintiff or the defendant because you can accept either to particulars of claim or declaration or to a plea. So when the excipient alleges that a pleading against which he accepts is inherently defective, how many days does he have to bring that, to raise that exception? It's the period allowed for the filing of any subsequent pleading. Right, so now you must look at who he's appearing for. If it is raised in relation to a defective particulars of claim or declaration, 20 days. Because remember, 20 days after the particulars of claim, the defendant must file a plea. Right. And if it is raised in relation to a plea, 15 days, because 15 days after the defendant files a plea, the plaintiff can file a replication. OK, so the amount of days depends for whom you are acting. Right. And then this is exactly in your in your books, in your um, notes, the example here, notice of exception, how you would. Um, word an exception, so just. Take care, take note of that. You do know that you're writing an open book exam. So whenever there are examples in your um in your manual, flag it because they may ask you exactly that. And then you can just refer to that as reference as to how to draft. Right. So exception is heard as an opposed motion, and the courts may either uphold or dismiss it, or it may order that the adjudication of the exception stands over until the hearing of the matter. Okay. So if it is upheld, then, then obviously that's the end of the matter. And if it is dismissed, um, the main matter still continues. Can you appeal against an exception? Also again, depending on what the court has decided. If the court um, dismissed it, obviously, then the main matter still stands and you can still adjudicate. So you can't appeal that upheld if it was a final decision and it brought an end to the litigation. Then you can appeal. Remember, you can only appeal to final judgments, not to interim. Um, where the main action is still pending. Right, so the test that the court applies and this is where I said to Nazir, I will show later on, is it Nazir? Yes. The excipient must establish that the pleading is excipiable on every reasonable ground. Right? The pleader, this is now the person who drafted the pleading to which an exception is raised, that pleader is entitled to a charitable interpretation. If there are minor blemishes, minor things that are wrong, and you can argue, but by further participation, these will become clear. So minor blemishes can be cured by further. Hello. Is there a question? Oh, OK. The pleadings must be read as a whole. As a whole, yes. So you read the pleadings as a whole, and if it is not acceptable on every reasonable ground, and you can understand if you read the whole pleading what is meant, then the court will not uphold the 
exception and the court will dismiss it. So remember the court is charitable towards the pleader and if there are minor blemishes that can be fixed by further participation, the court will allow that. Yeah, that is the test that the court applies on exception. Right, if you do not take exception when you were supposed to take exception, right? For example, you receive the particulars of claim and you see that the cause of action is not properly described in here, or it's if it's based on a delict, all the elements of a delict is not present. And you think to yourself, no, but this is a winnable case. I'm going to win this case. Let's see where he goes with this. And you don't take an exception. The court won't be happy with you because it is the duty of the litigant to take the most expeditious course to bring the litigation to finality. He should take such exceptions as will dispose of the dispute or bring the proceedings instituted to a conclusion. And the court will in each case apply discretion and ask whether the party who did not take exception when he should have was unreasonable in failing to do so. So. Remember, I told you in litigation, the successful litigant is always entitled to his or her costs, right? If there's no cause of action or no defense and you didn't take exception to that, the court will look at whether you should have. You should have seen that you can take an exception and you could have brought this whole litigation to an end. But you decided you're going to go through and you're still going to win. And then at the end of the day, you win. The court will punish you. You won't get your cost, even though you are the successful litigant, because you were supposed to have accepted and brought the case to finality earlier on. So the court will, in each case, ask whether the party who did not accept was unreasonable in failing to do so. And if yes, he won't be he won't be entitled to his trial cost, even though he will be the successful litigant. Right, that's exceptions. Now let me just. Any questions? Sorry, I, I'm moving between screens and I don't always know. Are there any questions? No, I'm moving on. There is Tapedi. Yes, advocate. I, I'm just. I just want to understand because uh, you you said that when the exception is raised, yes. the court can either grant or uh, that element when you say it can suspend it until the end of of of. The, oh, it can decide things. that it's not going to hear it at that stage, but it will deal with the exception. The court has that discretion, yes, at the trial. The court has that discretion. In that case, the court can't say, but you should have raised an exception and now you're not entitled to your costs because you're successful. Okay, then the court will then hear it after all the arguments are made to test whether indeed there was, they should yeah. have been. The court will you sometimes deal with it at the end. It's up to the court. The court has that discretion. Okay, thank you. Okay. Right, anything else? Okay. Um, we are still dealing with defective pleadings, um, and now we are with irregular steps. Now, remember I mentioned irregular steps to you when we were dealing with Rule 18. I have it there again. If a pleading fails to comply with Rule 18, remember what Rule 18 is? It tells you what must be in a in a particular soft claim. If it's based on a contract, if it's based on a delict, what must all be included, right? That is that is the I told you that's the most important rule for drafting. The equivalent of of Rule 18 in Match Court, just for your information, is Rule 6, right? So if a pleading pleading fails, for example, to comply with Rule 18. You don't take a further step. You just, before you do anything, because once you have done something, then you have condoned that irregular step. You don't take a further step. You send a notice to your opponent to remove that cause of the irregularity, and you make an application. And if they don't remove it within a certain amount of time, I'll tell you the times now, then um, that you make an application and you can have the pleading set aside as an irregular step. Right? So you must write to them. Don't do anything. Write to them. Say this is wrong. What you've done is not in terms of the rules. It is incorrect. Fix it. And if they don't fix it within the time allowed, 
then you can go to court and have the whole pleading set aside. Right, so I'm going to tell you examples of irregular proceedings so that you just get into the picture of it. Right, these are a few examples. The, lists on, the list is not exhaustive, but uh, as an example so that you know what is irregular. If a summons is not served in accordance with the rules, now we do know that the first process, the first process in proceedings must be served by the sheriff. If that is not done and it's not an urgent application, there's no except other circumstances that that um, that justifies that, then that is an irregular proceeding. You don't do anything, you don't file a plea, you don't do anything, you send them the notice, you tell them fix this. Right, if an address for service of the documents did not appear from the summons, in the summons you must put an address within 15 kilometers from the court. If that's not there, that is irregular. Where pleadings were not signed in accordance with the rules, right? Remember, um, if it is a, a particular soft claim, which is part of a combined summons, it must be signed by an attorney and an advocate, and an attorney can sign a loan, provide identifies that he has right of appearance in the High Court. Now, sometimes attorneys forget to underneath their signature say certified with right of appearance in the High Court. And if that is done, you don't have to do anything. You can just um, send them the notice to fix that before you are required then to do anything. Where there has been a premature enrollment, sometimes people are eager to have their matter enrolled. Um, you can only enroll your matter after the pleadings have closed. You enroll it at court so that you can get in line for a court date. I can understand the eagerness, but if that has been premature, that is an irregular proceeding. When irregular notice of bar has been served, you get a notice of bar, but you've already filed a plea. Where review proceedings have been brought by way of an action procedure, this is where the wrong proceedings have been used, where there is a fixed category, you must either use an action or or an application and they've used the wrong one that is irregular okay so this is the procedure like i say that list is not exhaustive there are other irregular steps also within 10 days after you become aware of the irregular step you send a written notice to your opponent and you ask them to remove the cause of complaint within 10 days from receiving that notice provided that the applicant himself has not taken a further step in the proceedings. Remember, if you do a further step, then you lose the right to, to raise this. Where the cause of complaint is not removed within 10 days, the applicant then can apply to court within five days after the expiry of the 10 days to have the proceeding set aside. So when you set it down in court, it must be there must have been five days that lapsed after the 10 days and you can have the whole proceedings then set aside. Right, let me just see if there are any questions that I... Any questions? None whatsoever. I'm just moving along. Um, notice to applications to compel. Right, now in um, these rules, right? And the rules are there for a reason. Like I told you, it's one of the sources of high court practice. The rules is there so that the court can run smoothly and so that we can get our cases before the court with the minimum of, of um, problems. Everything is sorted. And if one of the parties then refuse to, to do what they are supposed to do in terms of the rules to take so that the case can go forward and you as a Litigate, litigate, litigator. You cannot take your case forward because you need them to participate. You can bring an application to compel them to comply with the rules. Now, this application is what we call an interlocutory application. Now, usually in most divisions, um, an interlocutory application is done in the a motion court where you bring that interlocutory application. I know in Houting they have a, a dedicated court where they hear just interlocutory applications. So they call that the interlocutory court. So all the interlocutory applications happens there. What interlocutory means is the same case that's going on. That main case is running. But to, 
to iron out all the issues in that main case and see that it gets to where it's supposed to get court date, you can go to and bring an interlocutory application so that that can be covered, right? So it is a interlocutory application is ancillary to the main case, but it's not the main case. For example, if you want your um, opponent to discover, you send them a notice to discover, and now they're obliged to file a discovery affidavit, and they don't do that within the time that they are um, that they are allowed to do it. You can go to court and ask them to be compelled. The court then makes an order and say, on within so many days of this order, you must comply with this court order. And if you do not do that, then the party who brought the application to compel can come to court again and they can have your pleading set aside. And so that is the risk that you that you run. So you can apply to court for an order to compel. Um, like, for example, in in Houting, um, the rules for applications, it said you can't get a court date in an opposed application. The of argument of both parties are not filed. Now, what, what happens is the defendant, I'm oh, sorry, not the defendant, the respondent, because I'm talking about an application. The respondent then decides he's not going to file heads of argument and, and they're trying to delay or whatever. I don't know whatever the reason may be, but they, they're not coming to the party. You can go to court as the applicant and compel them. And if they still then don't comply, then you can take the matter forward. But first you must compel them because there's a direction that said this must be done and that is not done. So compel them. There's a court order. They don't do that. And then you can go on. OK. Um, rule 30A, equivalent to 60A in the magistrate's court. That deals with application to compel. Right. Let me just see if I have a question. Yes, I do have a hand. Terence. Terence. You have my attention, yes. Yes, good evening, Advocate. Uh, good evening. Yes, thank you. I, I wanted to to to, to check. I, I was just uh, reading something uh, in the in, in in the newspaper. Is it allowed uh, whereby, uh, let's say, people are staying uh, in the complex and they have a dispute uh, with the with the uh, the directors uh, body corporate? And they refer the matter to the ombuds. And in the meantime, then they 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 get an attorney, and then they pay their money in the attorney's account uh, for the for the levies. So they don't pay now into the body corporate. Now they are paying into into the trust account. So and uh, and then the body corporate. Uh, uh, keeps on issuing summons every month. Is it is it is it is it normal? Uh, when the matter is still there in the ombuds being adjudicated. But um, does the does the body corporate know that the matter is being adjudicated? Yes, um, yes. And okay, so did is that raised in as a special plea that the the matter is currently? Um, is there a response to the summons? Oh, yes, the, the the attorney is uh, is is uh, is putting in intention to defend notices. Yeah. So I'm just saying. Uh, now uh, what we are realizing is that almost every month there are summons that are being sent out. Is it is that not an abuse of the court process? It can be seen as an abuse of the court process. It depends on the circumstances. But I mean, from what you are telling me, the limited information that I have, it seems like that. But I mean, I am a bit not cautious to just say that it is an abuse of process because I don't have all the information. Yeah. But from the limited information that you tell me, it can be seen. Yes, it's possible. OK, thank you. Andrew. Thanks. Thanks, Terence. Yes, Hassan. Hassan? Yes, I'm here. So yes. it's a very interesting one he raised about the, the ombud. So uh, if, if you can just clarify. So my understanding is that most body corporate rules require uh, any dispute with the body corporate or, or other members of the body corporate to be referred to either mediation or arbitration to mm. uh, 
to the ombud, and that's why we all pay, I think, what's called a CSOS levy or something like that. All right. So uh, his question is very interesting. Why, why would why would he actually engage an attorney, uh, you know, and take it to full blown litigation or defense if uh, his channels are actually open for an arbitration through CSOS? Uh, CSOS. That's number one, because the court is going to argue: Have you exhausted all uh, remedies? And one of the remedies is the ombud uh, ombud route. So I'm just a bit confused why why it would actually go uh, all the way through to uh, uh, to you know engaging an attorney to do that because I don't think uh, the CSOS or the ombud uh, route requires uh, formal legal representation uh, by either party. Uh, I'll, I'll just leave it there. And, uh, yeah, I think you the yeah, two of you can have a discussion discussion yeah. on 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 that. Okay, <laughs> yeah, we can we can have an on we can have an offline discussion on that. Yes, yeah, so you can right. have. Thanks. Yeah, because yes. you seem to have more information, and you can maybe give you more sure. information on that. Yeah, sure. Yeah, okay. sure. Thank you. Pontley, I was looking for you earlier on. You here? Yeah. Oh, sorry, I just had a connectivity problem. I just logged no, in very really late. Uh, back to yesterday's question. Uh, on page nine nine. Yes, what was the question the, again? The question was what happens when when, when the party don't want to, to give yes, this. doesn't concern. Yes, I went and I went to go and read that because I said no, that doesn't happen. Yeah, you said that. Remember, and then you showed me that and I said it said that you must get the consent mm -hmm. from there. Right. So I went and I went to go and read that. Um just um everybody I'm just moving slightly away from defective pleadings and I'm going back to rescission of a default judgment and Bontley, last night's question of Bontley. Um, let me just... I don't want to... I think it's page 99, yeah. Yeah, it's page 99. Do, do you see something else on the screen now? No, it's only defective pleadings. You're still seeing defective pleadings. Okay, yeah. I just wanted to um look, I just wanted to share. Bear with me. Okay, do you see that? Do, do you see um, um, writings? Uh, yeah, rule 31, this is uh, copied it from Erasmus, right? Judgment on confession and by default and rescission of judgments, right? That is what rule 31 says. And uh, on page 99, rule 31, 6 says the following. Um, I don't know if you can clearly see it. Any person affected by a default judgment which has been granted may, if the plaintiff has consented in writing to the judgment being rescinded, apply to court in accordance with Form 2B of the first schedule to rescind the judgment, and the court may, upon such application, rescind the judgment, right? So your question was, what if the party the withholds consent? Does that now mean that you can't rescind? Yes. Now, you're the note... In the notice, that's why I said I'm going to research it because I'm sorry to the people who drafted this because I know I'm being recorded. It's not always correct. It, ruled, it says on page 99, the requirement for Rule 31.6 is that consent must be obtained from the plaintiff. Yes. But if you, if you now listen to what I've read, I've just read part A, right? And mm -hmm. in part A, consent must be obtained. But if we go to part B, we can see that the judgment debtor against whom a default judgment has been granted or any person affected by such judgment may, if the judgment debt, the interest at the rate granted in the judgment and the costs have been paid, apply to court to rescind the judgment and the court may on such application by the judgment debtor or other person affected by the judgment rescind the judgment. So you see in part B, it doesn't require that you need the consent of the judgment creditor. So why I say this is misleading because it said consent must be obtained. Consent obtained if you go with the consent part A, right? 
but you can also apply for to have a judgment rescinded if you have satisfied the judgment deed. Now, these kinds of judgment, this is now not where uh, a deed is because you didn't defend it. This is where judgment was granted against you. And later mm -hmm. on, you have satisfied the judgment deed and now you want the judgment deed from your name or from your name. You don't want it to reflect on the credit bureaus. So then you can apply. The one avenue that you have is, as they say here, but that is 316A. You can get it with the consent of the judgment creditor. But you don't necessarily have to. If you can you bring an application and you can prove to the court that it has been satisfied, everything has been paid, the court can also grant it. So you don't always need the permission of the, of the party. Okay. That was your question. And what I told you is this is the magistrate's court. Now, there I must agree with you. I was under the impression that this, this specific section is only in the magistrate's court where, where the consent or where you can apply. But this was one of the amendments in 2019 where they also included it in the high court because in the high court, this was never part of the high court rules where you could get the permission of the person to rescind the judgment. That, that was never it. So. Yeah, it was only where you um, wanted to defend, you have a good defense and you missed out on your chance to defend and judgment was granted in your up absence. But this is the now, this is now the other one that they've also brought in the high court. But the rule, the, the note on page 99 is misleading because it says consent must be obtained. It not mm -hmm. must be obtained. You have a choice. If it is obtained, you can bring the application and then you can fill in form 2B. If it is if it is not obtained, you can still bring the application if you have paid everything plus the interest and then you do it, you fill in form 2C. Okay. Did I satisfactorily answer your query? Um, and, and like I say, um, it should have said rule 36, rule 31, bracket 6, and then it must be another brackets A, then that note would have been wrong. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. And then there's a B part also, as you can see. Okay. So just the one last question. Regarding rule 31, six, let's say it's uh, it's a default judgment in terms of rule 31, five, right? Whereby it's about the repossessing a car. So let's say- uh, and mm, that, At 31.5 is where the registrar is involved, right? Eh? Okay. It's done by the, the registrar. Yes, it's done by the registrar. In some yes. cases, such cases, they're referring them to court to be yes. heard by the, yes. by, the yes. by, by, by the judge. So let's say in this case, uh, this 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 matter was not referred to court, but the registrar just granted the matter. Uh, in such a case, can me can I am I going to appeal the matter, or I'm not satisfied with that with the judgment uh, of the registrar. Yes, I'm well, not the, the rule says if you if you heard here last night, if you are dissatisfied, look at D. I've got it here five, and then you go down to D. Any party, um, let me just put the, there. Any party dissatisfied with the judgment granted or direction given by the registrar may within twenty days, um, after acquiring that judgment or direction, set the matter down for reconsideration by the court. I think I know that, that would be your remedy. I think that I wrote the same. Oh, I think that. Yeah. Thank you for reminding me. I think I just, I missed that. Yeah. So, okay. No, I thank you on that. Okay. Okay. Are, are you happy with the explanation? Is, is there I'm anything? Happy, yeah. I'm happy with the explanation for rescission because I was a bit concerned uh, about the consent of the plaintiff. The consent. That, now, you yes. see, it's not required. You can you see from the rules? Just, just go and check. I don't know if you have access to the rules. You should have, um, but check it, and then you will see because that's what I did. Whenever you confuse, so so that's the notes. Um, if you want to, you can just put in an A in brackets next to thirty one six, because that pertains to A, and then there is a thirty one six B, which says if you have satisfied, you can. Don't need the consent. So consent is not needed in each and every case. So yeah, that that is misleading. The note is misleading on page ninety nine. Thank you, okay. Thank No you. problem. Okay, is everybody happy? Can I proceed? 
Right. We are still busy with defective pleadings. And um, 23 again. You can bring an application to strike out. Remember 23.1, rule 23.1 deals with exceptions where it's vague and embarrassing or it admits one of the essential parts for to sustain a cause of action or defense. Now 21.2 says that certain parts of a pleading can be struck out. So you can apply. You need to switch, need to yeah. switch your screen, I think. We still see oh, the rules. Oh, sorry, sorry. And yeah, I'm going on. Right, let me see. Um, right. OK, so you bring an application to strike out. Um, if the pleading contains a statement which are scandalous, vexatious or irrelevant, and your client will be prejudiced in the conduct of his claim, or of his defense, if the statements are not struck out, you bring an application to strike out those parts. OK, so if the pleading, for example, says something like. What 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 example can I use now? Um, I once did a matter where. I didn't put it in, but it would have been. A, a, that could have been a subject for strike out where my client wanted me to put in. It, it had to do with tenders, want to put in at the reason why a specific person got the tender is because he has an affair with a municipal manager. So that would have been irrelevant, scandalous, vexatious, and they could have brought an application to strike out. And remember, you can put those things and, and the client actually in that case insisted that I put it in and I said, no, they're going to bring an application to strike out and then you are going to incur that cost because you will have to pay that costs for that. So you don't put nonsense like that in. So anything that is irrelevant to the subject matter, don't put it in. Don't say um, my husband in his previous marriage was also having a face. That's got nothing to do with this. I'm just trying to make an example so that you get where I'm going. So. Applications to strike out, that is what it is, but then it is only that part of the pleading that is struck out, right? I give you this example. What is the this question? What is the difference between an exception and an application to strike out? And this it is. This is it. An exception implies that the pleading objected to, taken as it stands, is legally invalid for its purpose. An application for striking out of offending allegations within the meaning of that term in Rule 23.2 applies to allegations that if removed from the pleading will not affect its legal efficacy. So application to strike out, it's just striking out a certain part of the pleading. Whereas an exception can bring an end to the whole procedure. That is the fundamental difference between the two. And um, remember, if you draft, don't put irrelevant offending allegations in your pleadings because you are just calling for a uh, uh, an application to strike it out and then your client will have to pay that costs. Right, so um, we were talking about amendments. And Rule 28 deals with amendments. Now, Rule 28 um, allows you to amend your pleadings. I've already touched on amendments. Whenever you've made a mistake in the pleading, you have maybe admitted something that you should not have admitted. We do that. Um, you can amend your pleading. So you send a notice to amend to your opponent. And you tell them, um, uh, sorry, a notice of your intention to amend. And you tell them, look, I intend to amend my, I intend to amend my um, particulars of claim. And you tell them what you want to amend. I'm going to delete that word. I'll say it's a black car and I'm going to put it was a white car. Just making a stupid example. Um, then your opponent has 10 days in which to object to the amendment. And if the 10 days expires. And he did not. Um, object to the amendment, then you can. Amend the relevant pages and then file it. That is as simple as an amendment is. If they object. 
to the amendment, then the court must decide whether the amendment should be allowed. Now, the court will decide if an amendment is allowed, if you can prove to the court that your opponent is not going to be prejudiced by allowing the amendment. And there the argument will be, is he being prejudiced? Um, must he now, does he need more time? Must he consult with more people? Because you have not, not done what you were supposed to do and the matter has to be postponed. The court will, in most cases, deal with, with, with that, um, with a relevant cost order. But in some cases, the court may also say that you're not allowed to amend. You have agreed to certain things and it must stand like that. So, yeah, depending on how you're going to argue it. So you first send the notice to amend and you tell your opponent what is going to be amended. And then um, he has 10 days. If you don't object, then you affect the amendment. You send the amended pap papers in the tram lines. We will say particulars of claim. You can say amended particulars of claim and then you send the new set so that we can differentiate and know, OK, this is the newest one. And people sometimes in litigation, you get the third, fourth amendment amended particulars of claim because as they go along, they amend. But especially if it's claims for damages and, and, and experts are involved and the, the amounts change that goes higher, then people amend the list of claim or the plea. We have made certain admissions, which you should not. We have, we have more information where you said you didn't know something and now you know you can do the amendment. Right. Um. Yeah. So a notice to amend. Right, let me just show you, tell you one trick that I um, for drafting. Yes, Hassan. Oh, sorry, I didn't see your hand. You should always just say because my screen is full of the slides. Yes. Okay, if you could just clarify, does that amendment uh, end up with an entirely new set of documents? Uh, you know, in your uh, like your particulars of claim. So is it only referring to those clauses that are amended? So does, only those does clauses, yeah. yeah. Only oh, those okay, so clauses the main... that you've intended, but some, yeah, so you're so supposed to, to do that pages. But sometimes um, if people delete large portions, they just do the whole thing over, but the those that is not amended remain the same and they just, because Yes, now. So, yeah, but it's only those particular clauses that you amend that the amendment affects, not the whole. Yeah. All right. So, so there's, a, there's, an, there's an amended document that's attached to the main pleadings, uh, the original pleading. No, and... no. The pleadings must be read as as one pleading. So, the you you don't have the old pleadings, and then you have amended pleadings. You have the first set of pleadings, and then you have the amended set of pleadings. So, the amended set of pleadings are the entire pleadings again. It's it's a repeat yes. of everything from the yes. first pleadings together yes. with the, change, the changes. With the changes, yes, affected. Yes. Ah, okay. All right, thank you. Okay. Let me just see something. Um, right, sorry. I just want to... Um. Yeah, what was I going to say? Okay, now... I said that that you must amend and you must afford your opponent 10 days in which to to object to the amendment. But um, just bear in mind also that even though um, it's 10 days, you can amend any time before the court hands down judgment. So even whilst you are busy with the trial and your witness says something different, you can ask the court to amend. And the only thing that you have to prove is that there's no prejudice to your opponent. Or if there's prejudice, the court will deal with that if they need to to, to, um, to give a, a postponement or whatever. The court will deal with that appropriately if the court allows the amendment. But you can up until the very last, up until before judgment is handed down, you can amend your whatever your particulars of claim, declaration, and all of those documents, um, notice of motion can also be amended. I just want to tell you exactly what 28, I think it's 10, I just want to make sure. Yes, it's 10. The court 
um, 28 rule 2018 says the court may notwithstanding anything to the contrary in this rule at any stage before judgment grant leave to amend any pleading or document on such other terms as or other matters as it deems fit. So don't don't be despondent if you didn't do an amendment. If you only realize during the trial that you need to amend, you can still amend up until the court hands down judgment. And the court will decide in each case whether the judgment should should be allowed or not. Right. Um, whether the amendment should be allowed or not. You you will argue um against it or for it depending for whom you are for whom you are appearing. Um, yes, I just wanted to Right, so um This is how some people would do it, and I'm um, realizing now that you're not with me. Um, let me just see. Okay, so this is case lines for those of you who are not in Johannesburg practicing. This is the app case lines. This, this is where you would load your cases on. So you can see that this was an amend amendment and this is how the, the amended pages was then filed that must just be inserted into the main one. They would then do it also, but just to file the amended pages in terms of the rule, they would say at the top, can you see there it says amended page. So you know that this is one of the pages that has been amended. Okay, so certain information came to light and they wanted to amend their pages they they do that and then they just file the amended pages okay i don't know if if, if that helps you right let me get out there and move back okay so these are all the documents and pleadings that can be amended um, yeah. And in the notice of intention to amend, you would say, be please take notice that the plaintiff intends to amend the particulars of claim as follows. And you would say paragraph three, um, the whole paragraph to be deleted and replaced with this or substituted for this. Or you can say this, this words are deleted and replaced with the following words. You just, you would just say that. So in the notice, you just say what? parts you intend to amend and if no objection within 10 days then you file the amended pages right let's let's move on right third party procedure i don't know did you do third party procedure yet rule 13 deals with third party procedure right um, does anybody know what third party procedures before I start? Do you know what third party procedure is? No. It's not the old. Um, the old third party claims that you had against the road accident fund. This is something totally different. For, yeah. Rule 13 deals with it, and this is what Rule 13 says. Where the party in the action claims that he is entitled in respect of any relief claimed against him to a contribution or indemnification from the third party. Where any question or issue in the action is substantially the same as a question or issue which has arisen or will arise between such party and the third party and should properly be determined not only as between any parties to the action, but also as between such parties and the third party or between any of them. The purpose of the rule is to avoid a multiplicity of actions. The rule is complementary to, but does not supersede the machinery as laid down in section two of the apportionment of damages. Right, so, 
Um, any any questions? You can ask. I can't see. I just want to open the room. No questions. Right. So this is um. Usually I demonstrate this on a blackboard. So I'm not trying to think how am I going to explain this to you? Let me start by explaining to you. Um, what the Apportionment of Damages Act says. Right, so the Apportionment of Damages Act, right? If let's go back to our collision of that red car and that green car, right? If the two cars collide, and um, we looked at it in, in, in the context of locus standi, now let's look at it again. Right, let's assume that for the purposes of this explanation, both the drivers are also the owners of the vehicles, right? So the owner and the driver is the same, so both have locus standi. Both cars have been damaged, right? So say red cars drive owner takes green car driver to uh, to court and claims damages to his vehicle, right? And in court, the court decides because based on the defense that green car had, that green that that red car contributed to his damages. He could have avoided his damages, and he did not do anything to mitigate his damages. He could have swerved to the left and avoided the collision or what. And the court then decides that 30% chance there would have been for red car to avoid the damages. Green car, who is the defendant, is 70% liable for the damages. Now say red car claimed a thousand rand from green car. And the court says, green car, you are 70% liable. In terms of the apportionment of damages act, Green car must then pay red car 700 rand because the court has decided that red car is 30% liable. So for 300 rand of the damages, that was his own fault. That is what the court decided. That is the apportionment of damages act, right? Now, now the rule 13 third party procedure is um, complementary to that. It doesn't replace that. Okay, I just wanted you to, to understand that before I go to the third party procedure. Now the third party procedure, let's again have the two vehicles. Now the driver of the one vehicle, I, th I think um, I must get that slides. Maybe I can just can get it better, describe it better with a slide. Um, sorry. We are seven o'clock. I'll get the slides up. Let's take our break and then I'll explain it. Let's take our break until quarter past. It's almost seven. Right, um, I'll be back at quarter past and then we can deal with this. Okay.
I am back. So we will proceed. We're busy with the rule 13. That is the third party procedure, right? And explain to you, I said to you that this doesn't, um, it is, it is um, complementary to the procedures laid down in the Apportionment of Damages Act. And I've illustrated to you what apportionment of damages means. That means where the defendant um, and the plaintiff both are responsible, the court will decide to what proportion and then make an order in favor of the plaintiff for whatever proportion the defendant should pay the plaintiff. And the rest of the damages is then attributed to the plaintiff themselves and therefore the defendant don't pay for that. And I've used the example of a 70-30 split of damages, right? Now I want to explain to you the third now, third party procedure is um, when when a party claiming a um, contribution or the indemnification, as I've read to you, right? And I've, I've used this example. OK, now in this example, for the purposes of explaining the rule 13 procedure, the third party procedure. Let's assume that um, the red car's driver is not the owner. Right? So, so it is not the owner of the vehicle. Right. The owner of the vehicle is somewhere else. The owner didn't drive the vehicle. It's maybe the, hus the husband or the sister or the mother. But it's not the, the, the owner and the driver were two different people. Right? Now the red car is damaged. So the we now know from locus standi that the driver doesn't have um, legal standing because she's not the owner. She didn't suffer losses. The owner has legal standing. So the owner institute a claim for damages against the driver of the green vehicle, against this blue hat guy. So the owner sues the defendant. Blue hat guy is the defendant. Right. The owner does not join this yellow, um, this woman with the yellow on, doesn't join her as a co-defendant because it's, 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 let's say it's they sisters. It's a sister. She's not going to take a sister to court to stand um, opposite her as a defendant. So she's not going to take a sister to court. She's claiming from him for the damages suffered by her for her car, right? He says, no man, the driver of that car, your sister, can contribute to the damages or indemnify me from the damages. And then he serves a third party notice on her. She then becomes the third party in the proceedings. Right. So we have a plaintiff, we have a defendant. The defendant has served a third party notice on the driver and says you can in, you can contribute to, to whatever damages is being claimed from me. So the uh, uh, sues him for a thousand rand. Right. And the court hears the matter. The third party as the third party has an opportunity to also state their facts before the court. The third party participate in the matter. One of the reasons for the third party procedure is to avoid a multiplicity of actions. Because the court is dealing with the facts, all the parties are before the court, right? But now let me just get back to third party procedure because now I must... Sorry about that. Right. Um, this is the third party procedure, right?
right? The purpose is to avoid a multiplicity of actions that I said. The nature and the grounds is set out in the notice. The notice is then served um, on the third party. Um, and it must be served before the close of pleadings. If the pleadings have already closed, then you must bring an application to serve a third party notice. Right? This is the thing that I want to tell you. Although the third party is now participating and the court is hearing evidence and hearing the side of the third party, the court in a third party procedure where a party has been joined as a third party in an action or an application, you can also join a third party. No judgment sounding in money may be sought against the third party. Right? All that can be sought is an apportionment of fault in the form of a declaratory order. So, like in our example, the court says um, the defendant driver of the green, green car is 70% um, liable for the damages and the driver of the red car 30% liable. The owner is suing driver of the green car for a thousand rand. The driver of the green car said the driver of the red car is a joint wrongdoer, served a third party notice on it, but the court is not going to make a judgment against um, the driver of the red car because the driver of the red car is not a defendant. The defendant must pay the whole thousand rand and with that declaratory order, you can then go after the driver of the red car to contribute and to pay him the difference what the court has declared. The court has already heard the evidence, so you can go after and then he can stand opposite the driver of the red car as plaintiff defendant. Right, that is basically what this is. Now, I expect some questions because I don't know if I... Um, I, I, if it is understood by you, because I know this, uh, it usually takes time to sink in. Um, OK, I've got a question. Yes. What you're saying, OK, let's say, um, like you say, then the, the, the driver of the green car can say that it can claim that money from the person who was actually driving, but he will pay the whole thousand rand and then claim that portion from that other person. So in other words, it's not the sister against exactly. the sister. It will be it will be the guy against the driver. So the sister still stays out of yes. it. Yes. Okay. Yes. That they are not they are not um um like um opponents in, in, in the court. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. The court makes a declaratory order. Um, as to um, how much wrongdoing, but the court doesn't make an order to say you owe the plaintiff X, Y, and Z. You owe your sister money. The court won't say that. The court will mm. just say you are responsible for so much damages, and then the defendant can sue, can claim from the red, from the joint wrongdoer who is the driver, mm. whatever he had to pay. So the owner right. of this car still stays out of it. It's between the two of them. Yes. All right. Yes. OK, that's third party. OK, if there's no further questions, we'll proceed. <clears throat> right, then we get to the stage that we call close of pleadings, <clears throat> referred to as litus contestatio. Now, this is if any of the parties joined issue without alleging any new matter and without ending, I uh, sorry, adding any further pleadings. This is exactly what Rule 29 says that I've just replicated here. If the last day allowed for filing of a replication or subsequent pleading has elapsed and it has not been filed, if the parties agree in writing that the pleadings are closed and such agreement is filed with the registrar, unable to agree as to the close of pleadings and the court upon the application of a party declare the pleadings to be closed. Right, so you might be wondering as you are sitting there now, why would it be necessary for the court to declare pleadings to be closed? Because with the fluxion of time, pleadings will eventually be closed. So why would we need to approach the court to tell us that the pleadings are indeed closed? This will arise in the case of a claim for personal injuries. Remember, a plaintiff's rights are freezed at the moment when the pleadings are closed. If you have a claim for pain and suffering, that claim 
is not transmissible on the death of the injured before the close of bleedings, nor is it capable of being transferred by session before the bleedings have closed. So in this case, um, if the plaintiff should die, you can now understand why the defendant would say pleadings have not closed yet and why the plaintiff would insist that the pleadings have closed. And in that case, people would go to court and they would then argue about when the pleadings have closed and the court will have to adjudicate and make a decision as to when the pleadings have closed and whether the claim for pain and suffering remains and can be transferred to the estate of the deceased. Right, having said that, we have recently in our law I have a bit of development there. I know in Gauteng they had that case, um, and, and some of you might recall it, it was the case of the silicosis, that class action that was brought against um, the big mining companies. I forget the name. I know the case name, it's Nkala versus Nkala and others. I think it's Anglo-American. I don't know who the mine, miners, mine owners were. There was that case and they had a special um, motion court constituted specifically to hear issues on that case before the case went to court. Now, in that special motion, um, the court actually said that even though some of the claimants is not part of the class action, they did not institute an action, and even though they have died before the close of pleadings, long before the close of pleadings, their heirs can still claim. So that is totally against this. So that is why I say there is some development, but that um, that case actually then um, settled out of court, so didn't go further than that. But look at that case, if you ever come across a situation like that, and there you can find um, argument, persuasive argument as to why it should be allowed then that um, pleadings doesn't have to be closed for you still to be able to claim. I'm just mentioning that as an A side. Right. Are there any questions? Yes, there's a hand. Dolile. You may ask. Unmute. Good morning, ma'am. Um, I have a question regarding the third party procedure. Mm -hmm. Rule 13. Um, I just want yes. to know what what procedure can be followed by um, the um, the man in the green vehicle if the third party refuses to abide by the judge by the judgment in terms of the apportionment. If if the sister refuses to pay, what procedure can the third money uh, the third um, the, the man in the green car follow in order to acquire the money with Look, all he has is a declaratory order. The court has just declared that he owes, so he will have to go back to court and then prove based on the declaratory order that he has a claim against the, and he has paid um, the plaintiff, and based on that he has a claim against the driver of the red car, who is not the owner of the red car. Yeah, but only based on that. So he has a declaratory order, he don't have it's not um, the rule specifically says it doesn't make an order sounding in money against the third party. It just declares the liability of the third party um, and then the defendant must then claim it back from the third party. He, they don't have to go back to court and prove everything. It's, it's to avoid that. So they hear everything together. It's to avoid a multiplicity of actions. But he has a declaratory order in on that he can then claim from the she doesn't have to pay, the, but if the court orders, then she will have to pay. She, de she doesn't have to pay just because because it's only a declaratory. It doesn't say you must pay the 300 rand. It just say you are liable for 30 percent of the damages, which which is 300 rand. But it doesn't say you must pay the defendant so much. The court order doesn't order her to pay. So you must go further. And if she does, if they can't come to an agreement, you must go to court then. Yes. Did I answer you, Golile? Yes, you did. Thank you so much. Okay, Hassan, your hand is up. Yeah, ma'am. Can you just clarify who is the third party? Is it the owner or the driver? It's the of, it's the uh, person of the, of the, of the it's car. the person who can indemnify the plain, the defendant against the plaintiff or contribute to the damages 
suffered by the defend suffered by the plaintiff that the plaintiff alleges the defendant caused. It is a joint wrongdoer, but it's not joined as a co-defendant by the plaintiff. Now, so let's take the example you've given in the red car. Uh, the so the driver of the red car is not the owner. Yeah. Right. So the owner sues the driver of the green car. The driver of All the right. green car says, I'm not alone responsible for your damages. Your sister was driving your vehicle. Um, and then serve a third party notice on the sister. The court doesn't make a, a order a, a sounding in money against the sister. The court just declare the sister participate, come with her evidence and everything. So every all of that has been sorted. But what the defendant has is a declaratory order that says the sister is liable for so much. The defendant must pay the plaintiff for the damages suffered, but he can go after the sister for the monies that the court declared. Okay, now what, what's confusing now, both are sisters of each other. So when you're saying they're the... Well, it's not necessarily sisters. just sisters. I just use that as an example. You won't take your sisters to, to court as a co-defendant to the defendant. No, no, so, so in, in, in this example, yes. is, the, is the driver of the green car claiming from, or the driver owner of the green car claiming from the driver of the red car? Because the driver no, of the red car the was red driving car the is driver the of the car. The red car owner is the plaintiff. Oh. The green the car, car is the defendant. The defendant okay, is could... saying, a red car owner, your damages is not just caused by me. You're claiming from me a thousand rand. It's not just me. The driver of your car was also responsible. You're not suing her, but then the red, the green car owners, that's the defendant. Something notice on the driver of the red car. All right, but if the situation was turned around, if, uh, if, the, if the driver of the red car was suing the owner of the green Don't car. Don't have legal standing. The driver of the red car, if, it is, if that person is not the owner, didn't suffer any loss. Oh, all right, but, but injury is a separate issue altogether. Uh, no, injury is from the road accident fund. I'm talking about yeah. the damages to the yeah. vehicle. All no, right. in, right. injuries right. is from the road accident fund in South Africa. They are liable for any bodily injuries sustained in a motor vehicle accident. All right, yes. and then and then you indicated, just to clarify, the, such a judgment is not uh, does not sound in money. So It's not so sounding what it in money. What, what yeah. I mean is he won't say you must pay 300 rand. Sus yeah. 300 rand to the plaintiff. Because remember, they are not opposing each other. Although the defendant says this is a joint wrongdoer. So the court will say the, the portion that you are responsible, but it's only a declaratory order. The court doesn't say you must pay the plaintiff. So they need to sort it out amongst themselves. The defendant and, and yeah, the defendant must go after the sister then. Not, nothing to do with the owner of the vehicle. Uh, after the driver, the, the co, the joint wrongdoer. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions? There's an example of a third party notice in your. I have a question, ma'am. Yes, you can ask. Yes, uh, the declaratory uh, order uh, with regard to the third party, would it amount to a liquid document that uh, can be used against the third party? Yeah, the court has to say, if it is a liquid document, what is the definition of a liquid document? Do you know? Because uh, I, th I it think... It depends on whether the interest is... is, is, is um, fixed or whether the interest chains and whether it can be, whether, whether it's a fixed amount, because uh, the definition of a liquid document is an amount, it's in writing and it says an, an amount is owed by uh, somebody I'm, to someone. And I'm, I'm now just talking to you, it doesn't, it doesn't meet the requirements of a liquid document because it doesn't say that the, the driver of the red car owes anybody money. It just says, was responsible for so much damages, but it doesn't say you owe money because the court didn't make an order sounding in money. 
Okay. okay, because I was asking this question uh, oh, with a view that when the uh, judgment is issued, if there are two parties, one party would be 75% responsible, the other 25% uh, responsible. Surely when you calculate that, then you come up with a... a, a, a with a fixed a, amount, yes. Yes, yes. Yeah, you, you do come up with a fixed amount. I hear where you're going with that, but does it say he owes that money to a certain person? Because that is the definition of a liquid document. That is where you must, that is where, what you must satisfy if you want a document to be liquid. Thank you. Okay. Right. Um, can I move on? Right. Um, now we had the close of pleading, so we come to discovery. Now, I, I, I am told that you have already um, done match court practice. Is, is that correct? Hello? Yes. 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 So everything that I'm telling you all the time, you know everything already. And I'm just repeating what you already know. Am I correct in that? Not really. If the rules are the same, yeah. Yeah, so you knew all the stuff already. So I'm just... <laughs> repeating myself. Anyways, so you've done discovery. Rule 23 in the match code deals with discovery. In the high court, it's rule 35. Right, so they get just no different notices of discovery. And um, I'm going to deal with each and every one. Right. But before I get there, I just want to tell you that you have to discover, even though you don't receive a notice to discover, when. Um, yeah, not even there yet. When, in terms of Rule 37 1, um, when the court has given a date for the trial, there's an obligation to make discovery in all cases, even if the other party does not require it, and the affidavit must be filed, even if there are no documents to discover. Right? That is automatic discovery, and this must happen 15 days after you receive notice of a trial date. So, if you get a notice, to discover from your opponent, then you are obliged to discover. But if nothing like that happened and now you get your trial date and you have nothing to discover, you must still file the discovery affidavit in terms of this rule. OK, so there's going to be discovery whether you have anything to discover or whether you are called to discover or not. OK, now going back. Just remember, um, no party may for the purpose use a document at a trial, for any purpose use a document at a trial, if the document has not been disclosed previously and the other party who is not obliged to discover such a document will be entitled to use such document at the trial. Right, so if you, um, now, um, yeah, let me come to discovery. Right. Now, any party can send a notice to discover to the other party. Rule 35 deals with that. Apart from that, before we come to this discovery that you now get after the close of pleadings, Rule 35, 14, let me just make sure that it is 14. Um, 35, 14 is a nice tool to know if the plaintiff in these particulars of claim, let's see, is it that? Yeah, if the claim plaintiff in his particulars of claim refers to a document and the defendant don't have that document and before the defendant files a plea, the defendant can also serve this um, notice in terms of Rule 13. It says after appearance to defend has been entered, any party to any action may for purposes of pleading require any other party to make available for inspection within five days a clearly specified document or tape recording in such party's position, which is relevant to a reasonably anticipated issue in the action and to allow a copy of transcription to be made thereof. Um, state in writing within 10 days whether the party receiving the notice objects to the production of the document. Yeah, so just to remember, we'll if, if if there's some certain mention made particulars of claim, you can at that stage also use this vehicle, Rule 35 <clears throat> 14, to get a document um, if you need that in order for you to be able to plea. 
Right. Now, Rule 35 one says that um, you can send a notice to discover to your opponent. Now, um, you just send a notice in terms of the Rule 35 one. And if you read Rule 35 one, and this is the tip that I wanted to give you, but I forgot earlier on when we did um, amendments. A tip for practice. Whenever you in practice are going to be required to do a notice. Say you're doing articles and your principal says do the notice. And you know it's in terms of a rule, but you do not have a precedent, which sometimes happens. You don't have a precedent. You don't know what to do. Follow the wording of the rule in the notice. Right? You, you will get the hang of it soon. Make it sound logical, make the ne necessary amendments, but see to it that the words that are in the rule is in the notice and then your notice cannot be wrong. So, for example, if it is a notice in terms of Rule 35 one, it's the Rule 35 one says any party to any action may require any other party there to buy notice in right, to make discovery on oath within 20 days of all documents and tape recordings relating to any matter in question in such action. Um, so, so, so just to to quickly explain it to you, then you will say be pleased to take notice that you are required to and then you follow the words to make discovery on oath within 20 days of all documents and tape recordings relating to the matter in question in this action. And then you just follow the wording and then there's your notice. So if you do a notice of exception, it's in terms of rule 23. What the words say and follow it, make it sounds logical and intelligible. And your notice will not be incorrect. And if you don't know what to call the notice, what I see people do, they will say not discovery notice, but notice in terms of Rule 35 one or notice in terms of Rule 23 or notice in terms of Rule 28, which is an amendment notice of intention to amend and follow the wording of the rule, make it let it make sense. And there you go. Right. So if you receive a notice to discover, it obliges the other side to deliver a discovery affidavit Schedules, right now the discovery affidavit will contain a list of the documents it's not like in america where they come with a truckload full of documents and say you wanted this here's it doesn't work like that if you get a notice to discover all that the plaintiff has to do is to depose to an affidavit wherein he will say what relevant documents to the case he have or had so the schedule in the affidavit, schedule one will have a list of those documents and tape recordings that is in the possession of the party. Um, and, and schedule one will have two parts. It has part one, which is documents and tape recordings. The other side is entitled to inspect. And then part two will have privileged documents. Those documents and tape recordings, the other side is not entitled to inspect since they are privileged. And then schedule two will have a list of documents and tape recordings which were once in the possession of the party, but no longer are. Right. So there is an example of a discovery affidavit. If you, if you want to see what it looks like um, in your notes. Find it. Oh, but incidentally, coincidentally, the, the third party notice example is on page 249. And I can't find the discovery affidavit line. I've marked it. Oh, okay. Anyways, there is an example. Just look at your um, forms and precedent section of your. Um, and you will find a discovery notice with the schedules and the parts so that you can see what it is. Now in the notice, the documents are listed. Right, what, what, what you have. Okay, so, and it must be within 20 days and we still follow the rules in terms of the rules. First day out, last day in. That is the 20 days. How are you going to compute it? You don't compute weekends and public you don't count the first day, that is the day on which you get the notice, but the last day you count in, right? If your um, 
you get this the discovery affidavit and you now look through the documents that has been discovered. Your client might tell you, look, they, everything is not on there. There's some shares in a company that is not being discovered or there's, there's other properties or, or whatever. It must be relevant, obviously, to, to the um, litigation, to the action. You can then ask for better discovery. Okay, so then you send a notice and say, you didn't discover everything, but you can't go on a fishing expedition and just say there's certain things that you didn't discover, discover everything. When you do an, a, a better discovery notice, at least in terms of Rule 35.3, you must say which documents is not disclosed. So you must say there's shares in that company, you didn't disclose that. There's that property, you didn't disclose that. So you must specify the documents that is required to discover, and the documents obviously must be relevant to the litigation. Okay, so you send a notice for better discovery. And if that is not complied with, you can obviously go to court and say the opponent does not want to comply. Right, now you look at the list of documents and there's certain documents that you want to see. So you send a notice to inspect. That is a form. There's form 13. It's in terms of Rule 35.6. This notice allows you to inspect and make copies of the documents listed in the schedules attached to the discovery affidavit. Okay. Um, usually what happens is people scan it in for you and they send it to you. In the past, you used to send the messenger who's going to make copies of all the documents so that you can have copies of it works differently now, but you, you must send a notice to inspect and they will send you those documents. If you've sent any of these notices and they fail to comply, I've already dealt with a notice to compel in terms of Rule 30A, right? The court can dismiss the claim or strike out the defense. So you go to with a notice to compel, the court will then give them a time within which they must comply. And if they do not, then you can go back to court and dismiss the claim or strike out the defense. Or the court might say might still allow them to discover late and then say they must pay cost on a punitive scale because they are not playing by the rules. Right. You can also send them a list to specify certain documents. This means that um, they must list documents and tape recordings that they intend to use at the trial. This gives you a good idea of how they're going to conduct their case. So you can say, okay, from all these documents, because remember, what they discover is a relevant document. So it does not necessarily mean they're going to use it. So now you can ask them to be specific, specify what documents you are going to use. So that, you, and then you have an idea how they're going to conduct the case. You can also send them a notice to produce, a notice in terms of Rule 3510, that, that means they must bring certain of the documents that they've discovered or tape recordings, they must bring it to court. You can then submit that document to the court as evidence in your case. You do not have to prove that the document or tape recording is original and authentic. You may simply hand it into evidence. Okay, now what I mean by that, you do not have to prove that the document or tape recording is original or authentic. Usually in court, when you hand up a document, all the writer they are and ask, is that your signature? Did you write this document under what circumstances? All of that, you must call an extra witness. If you ask them to produce, you don't need to do that to prove the authenticity of a document. It's their document. You want to use it. You sent them this notice so you can use it. It, it shortens the court time, avoids calling unnecessary witnesses. Right. The same, you can ask them, documents that you have discovered in your discovery affidavit that they must admit it. And then you also don't have to prove the authenticity of the documents. If they have admitted it, the proceedings costs and court time. Right, are there any questions on discovery? I'm sure you, you know that already. Do you have any questions for me? May I ask you to just go back to the previous slide? Okay. Oh, oh, rule 359. That one. Yes. Admit. Yes. A notice to admit. admit. We have only got three child. All right, no, that's fine. Thank you. Okay. Fine. 
are the yes parents. Thank you, Advocate. Thank you, Mayor. I, 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 yes, I wanted to to check. So, in a case where the other party has already um, filed the the evidence as exhibit already, so will you also still have to hand them in after the notice of discovery uh, and 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 file them with the court? I don't understand. You, you're talking about exhibit. Just, just take me. So I, I think you're, yes, your, your 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 previous statement. You are saying that uh, for so after the notice of discovery, and then you 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 obtain the copies. You send the notice to it. Hmm? Yes, yes. After you you have obtained the copies, you've made the copies. Notice of inspection. Then you've made the copies and the photographs. And and now you want to hand them into the court. I'm saying after you have, because of you will have taken them from the opponent. So I'm saying, what if they've already filed? Yes, listening. In a case where they have yes. already, because you said uh, because advocate you said that they can you can still use them, and then there won't be a contestation with regard to. Authentic authenticity of the document. That the document is what it purports to be. Okay, let me explain this to you. If it is a, um, a if it is a, a contract or if it is a a letter sent from somebody to somebody else, me admitting the document, a party admitting the document, admits that the document is what it purports to be. That means it is a letter. But it does not mean that you admit the contents of the letter. That must all be proved. It does not mean that you agree that that is the truth and is correct. You just admit that the document is what it purports to be. So you don't have to call somebody to say, is this the report that you've comp co compiled or is this the notice that you send or is this the letter that you sent, um, when did you send it, how did you write it? You don't have to do that. We, uh, we admit that the document is what you say it is. It is a letter from me to you. But we're not admitting the contents of the letter as being fact. That must still be proved in the trial. I don't know if you understand. Okay, um, um, yes, I, I, yes I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get there. I'm looking at uh, Rule 36.6. It requires that... Uh, 36. 36, okay, we, we now, we know not with discovery anymore. We now at um, Rule 36, yes. Expert 36. notices and stuff, yes. 36.6, yes. uh, yes. I think uh, just to say, uh, those documents, you, you, you then have, have to make them accessible to a litigant requiring inspection. Yes. So I'm saying after they have inspected uh, the document after the notice of discovery, and now they want certain documents, they want to make copies and records. Yes, they send you they want to inspect, to, yes. And then that is the opponent. Yes. So I'm saying, can then the, then you said that the opponent can then hand them over into the court for record. Yes, for rec but 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 not um. But you do you admitting the document does not mean that you admitting that what is in the document is the truth. It just means that the okay. document is the kind of document that they say in the discovery affidavit, and I found it in your notes, um, two fifty one. Right, um, that is 250, 251. Okay. Example of the discovery affidavit. Right, so let, um, let, if we look at Schedule 1, Part 1 on page 252, the first document is a copy of invoice CBS for an amount. So if I admit that, then we admit that that is an invoice for a specific amount. So you don't have to call somebody who wrote the invoice and or and received the money or whatever. You don't have to call that because I admit that it's an invoice. But whatever is written on that invoice, I don't necessarily agree with that. 
I don't admit the content. I just admit, admit that the document is what it purports to be. Like minutes of a meeting held between plaintiff and defendant. That is another item here. I admit this is the minutes of the meeting. I don't admit that what is written in there really happened at the meeting, but this document is the minutes of the meeting. A statement by a driver. I admit it is a statement, but I don't admit the contents of it. I, I'm, okay. am, am, I, am I losing you or do I have you? <coughs> no, no, I think I follow now. I, I, okay. I think I follow. Because so admit, it, yeah. yeah. It means uh, at, at this stage, it will just be an admission. But, Not admission uh, of the contents, admission that the document is yes. what you say it is. It is a statement, it yes. is a letter, it yes. is a whatever, the, it is the, a quotation. The content, yeah. the content are subject to be ventilated. Yes, I can yes. cross-examine on that. I don't agree with the content. Yes. I agree, this okay. is the letter that was sent. But okay. what is in it is not necessarily true. But you say you have this letter. I agree that is that letter. So I don't have to call the writer there are to first prove that this is that letter that you wrote. Okay. Do you understand? Thank you. Yes. Thank you. You Advocate. save course, yeah. course time and costs. Right? Yes. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions? No. We shall go ahead. Um. Right. So. Then we come to Rule 36, which, which deals with inspections, examinations, and expert testimony, right? So um, I, I didn't mention this right at the outset when we started with Rule 35, but we've now entered into the sphere of the practical arrangements, right? So we have discovery. We do that. And now also, if um, the litigation is the subject of, of, of it has to be examined a person or a thing, then Rule 36 applies, right? The object of Rule 36 is to enable parties to litigation to test the strength of the case so that they can prepare for the trial and to limit the possibility of surprise, right? So um, in terms of Rule 36, if the person is claiming for bodily injuries, then the plaintiff must be available to be examined by the experts of the defendant so that the experts of the defendant can advise the defendant, look, yeah, she's got a back injury. She's got this and whatever. So, the, the, and Rule 36 makes provision as to how that is done. Right. If the um, litigation um, relates to an object then that object must be made available to the defendant's experts. For example, a motor vehicle that goes um, burst into fire on the road. You say it's because of I, my manufacturing problem, I didn't do something. You must make that vehicle available so that my experts can look at it, so that I can build up a defense. So Rule 36 deals with those aspects. Right. And then I'm, I'm, I'm still kind of, I'm going to come back to Rule 36. Let me just go here quickly. Further particulars for purposes of the trial, you can also request information that is necessary to enable a party to prepare for trial. So you can ask further particulars. It looks like usually is that, say there were certain admissions made in the plea and the plaintiff want further admissions because there has now been an, um, exchange of documents and stuff and things might become clear and there may be further admissions that maybe it's not in a amendment but you require it from your opponent you can ask them to make certain admissions do you still say that the person is not x y and z do you still say this have you changed and then they can make further admissions so or further particulars or you can ask more details like if the person say they lost they suffered loss of income you can ask okay now give me your Qualifications, give me previous job um, pay slips, what you earned, that further particulars for you to quantify. Right. You also um, subpoena witnesses to come to trial. So if you're going to call um, lay witnesses to come to the trial, you will subpoena them. Um, 
um, Rule 38 one deals with that and Form 16 to the Uniform Rules is a normal subpoena. Subpoena and Rule um, 38 four deals with subpoena to Castacum. That is the witness must come to the court with a doc. It's that that's had. Right, and yeah, I'm talking about witnesses. So this witness is not a party to the litigation because if the witness was a party to the litigation, you would have asked him to discover that document. But you can't send a discovery notice to somebody outside who's not a party. Let me give you an example. Say, for example, there's litigation between a person and a company. Right now, the company um, accountant has records that the company doesn't have, but the accountant who is independent has the reg has certain records of the company. You want that accountant to come to court to give evidence and you want him to bring certain documents with him. So you would send him a subpoena to Kastekum. Come to court with specific documents. OK, I don't know if this hands up because I can't see this none. Oh, you know all these things already. I'm just repeating what you already know. Sorry for that if I'm boring you. <laughs> right. Um, coming back to 36 with the, with the expert witnesses. Now, I've dealt with that. That was the lay witnesses. Now, expert witnesses, important. You are going to, um, I'm going to hopefully see you again in September when you do the two weeks of case casework that I've been doing online now for a couple of years. Um, this is a new thing that you get class, you get extra classes in high court practice and match court practice. It's the first time we're doing this. You'd usually just got the case law where you, we had two weeks together at the same time every day. And then you're going to deal with, with these kinds of things. So just pay attention. Rule 36.9 says the following. If you intend to call an expert, then if you are acting for the plaintiff, you must give notice um, 30 days after the close of pleadings. And if you are acting for the defendant, you must give notice not more than 60 days after the close of pleadings of your intention to call the expert. So you will say, I intend, the plaintiff intends to call the expert an orthopedic surgeon, Dr. X, to give evidence. That will be in your notice, right? And then, um, that is 36.9a. 36.9b will say, you must deliver a summary of the expert's opinion for the plaintiff, not more than 90 days after the close of pleadings, and for the defendant, not more than 120 days after the close of pleadings. So you get a 60 days after you've served the notice. You must now summarize what I'm going to say. So the plaintiff would have gone to the experts and the experts would have examined and compile a report, give you the report. You must summarize that report and then send it to your opponent and file it in court. What people do in practice is they just file the report. They don't summarize the report. But um, the rule says you must give a summary of the expert opinion. OK, it's it's not wrong to give the report. It's just that the rule says that. In terms of Rule 36.9, um, capital A, that is now a new, since 2019, a new rule that was added. The times in 36.9, was also changed. It used to be different. It used to be two weeks before the trial that you had to give notice and the expert report. Now it is after close of pleadings. So right at the beginning of the litigation, almost. And so in terms of 36.9a, the court says that the parties should endeavor to appoint a single joint expert. What, what that means is that in litigation, especially, um, personal injuries. You get the plaintiff's expert and you get the defendant's expert and they will give you two different views on what the injuries are and what the, the, the consequences of the injuries are, the fallout is going to be. Right? The court says you should endeavor to call one witness. Agree, we're going to use that orthopedic surgeon because essentially what an expert witness is, it's a person that gives an objective view to the court to assist the court to come to a conclude to, to come to a correct finding. In practice, those of you who are in practice, you know that you get 
experts for plaintiffs and you get experts for defendant. The plaintiff's expert will say this person can never walk again because of the whiplash. And then the defendant's expert will say, no, this person is fine. Two panadas a day and they can run a marathon. So you get that kind of diverse um, opinions. The courts say you must endeavor to, to, to get a joint expert. Um, in some cases it may work, but in most cases, no. Um, when you have an expert on either side of the same discipline, so two occupational therapists or two actuaries or whatever, they must file a joint minute 20 days, um, within 20 days of the last filing of the reports. So the court then wants the experts, and, and this they apply religiously, the expert must come together, they do it via email or on the phone, and they must look at each other's report and see how they can come closer together in their opinion and then give one opinion. And if there are certain aspects that they still disagree on, then the court is only going to adjudicate on that specific aspect. So the court is not going to go through each and every bit of the report, but only on where they disagree on. So that is the purpose of the joint minutes. Right. Um, do I have questions? Let me just check. No? Yes, you do, ma'am. Oh, OK. Ask. Uh, Ma'am, with regards to uh, expert witnesses, uh, uh, I'm I'm thinking of the Jacob Zuma case where he was examined at the prison by doctors, and the MPA needed to bring its own doctors to examine him. As far as I know, the NPA experts were refused because they. Uh, uh, Jacob Zuma and his uh, attorneys were saying they would second guess uh, Jacob Zuma's doctors. So sometimes it means these rules are not necessarily uh, complied with. Yes, um, was that um, was that in a civil procedure um, relating to a personal injury suffered by Jacob Zuma, or was it what is it? It was the parole, eh? It was the parole. Yes. Was it the parole? Yes. Yeah. Um, and and what is the procedure with parole? Is it is it a specific procedure? Because remember, he's not claiming damages because the rule thirty six specifically talk about claiming damages for bodily no. injuries, and no. I don't think the rule applies there. Where uh, okay. he is now, he has to he has to submit himself to being examined. By no, the, that's yeah, that's fine. I was only thinking. Uh, no, uh, I hear uh, you. I hear yeah. you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay. No problem. Any anyone else? Nope. Right. Um. Rule thirty six ten makes provision for when you are going to use um photographs, plans, diagrams, models, models of vehicles or models of stuff that you're going to use to demonstrate your case. We do it all the time. Diagrams, people draw diagrams, and then you have your witness and you say, look at the. And if you walk from there to there, what does that mean? So we use these things. So 60 days after the close of pleadings, you must give notice of your intention to use plans, diagrams, models and photographs. So you must tell your opponent, I intend to use this plan. I intend to use whatever. The other party can then inspect these. Um, plans, diagrams, models, and photographs, and must admit it within 10 days, right? Admit again that it is what it is purported to be, right? If no admission within 10 days can be received in evidence by the mere production and further proof, right? So if your opponent, if you've, in, in time, you've said gave him 10 days in which to admit to the documents or the sorry the plans the diagrams the models and the photographs and if you don't admit it you can still use it in court okay and but then you must prove the document then if it's a photograph or if it's a diagram you must call the person who actually drew the diagram and say what is this that you draw it was the scene of the accident it was i was This, this is the time I took it 
I went there and then that then you'll have to call that, but you can still use it by the mere production. If not, um, if 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 not, you have to get leave of the court to use it. That's if you did not um if they you did not timelessly give it to your opponent. Remember, your opponent can be prejudiced because you didn't tell them that you are going to use a diagram. They didn't have an opportunity to study the diagram and inspect it, use it in their consultation with their witnesses and ask the witnesses how to uh, tell me about. This. Do you propose I cross examine on this? Because that is what we do as, as legal practitioners. We get our information from the witnesses so they will guide us. So we need to get notice of that. Okay. So if you didn't do that, you can't just come to court and take out a bunch of photographs and says, I want to use this. Your opponent will get up and say, we didn't see that. And then there needs to be a postponement and then you will have to pay the wasted costs occurred by that postponement. Right, I've just got a question here. Um, as illustrating your act for the plaintiff in an action for damages in the high court, you are in possession of five photographs which you wish to tender in evidence at the trial, draft the necessary notice. So you would look at 3610 and you will see what it looks like. So in the tram lines, you can just say that. And then please take notice that the plaintiff intends, and that was the mark allocation, to tender evidence at the trial of this five photographs depicting the damages to the motor vehicle, or it can be bodily injury suffered, or the scene of the collision, and hereby offers inspection thereafter the defendant who is required to admit the same within 10 days after receipt of this notice. And that's, that's the notice. And you just follow the wording of the rule and you adapt it so that it makes logical sense. Right. Judicial case management. Rule 37A makes provision for judicial case management. Yeah, I have nothing there. OK, let me speak. Um, judicial case management. Now, cases need to be. Let me see you. I need to be a ripe for trial, right? Before it gets um, allocated. Now, in the practice directives of the different divisions, they have grouped certain cases, especially those cases of which there's a lot on the roll. Like, for example, the road accident fund matters, Minister of Police matters, MEC for Health matters in Gauteng. These are on the roll a lot. Every day there's like 60 of those or 100 of those matters on the roll for trial. So before a trial date is allocated to these matters, and because there are experts involved, usually if it is the, the quantification of the damages, experts must usually give evidence so that damages can then be determined. Um, sometimes in the past, this is what happened and how they came up with this rule. People used to come to trial and then they were not ready to proceed because the experts weren't ready. There's no joint minute by the experts. They didn't do things according to what they were supposed to do. Now they have the judicial case management. This is now where the, a judge oversees the case before they allocate a trial date. So you appear there, the judge looks at the file, the parties are there, and they then inspect the file to see if everything has been done. Has discovery been made? Is there still any outstanding issues for this to be discovered? Um, are all the expert reports in? Is the joint minutes and if anything is outstanding, the court may even tell you, OK, you have so many days then you must come back. I'm not going to declare um, to, to not declare. They certify the matter to certify this matter um, ripe for hearing. So then you have to go back and do certain things. And up, up until the, that court says this matter is now certified ready for trial then the registrar will allocate a trial date and then the matter is then ready to be heard. Judicial um, oversight is then exercised over matters to see that when it is allocated, the matter is ready to run and you're not going to waste unnecessary time. And one of the reasons for this is in the high court, unlike in magistrates courts, the high court has what we call a continuous role. 
right? This means a matter runs from the beginning until the end, until it is finished. So before the, the day before your matter is on the roll, you, you have to estimate how long the matter is going to be. It's five days now that you must file a practice note, and this is in terms of practice directives. So both parties must file a practice practice note where they are going to estimate the, the trial is going to be 10 days. Say, for example, they say it's going to be 10 days. Now the judge president or the deputy judge president, who is then in charge of, 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 of all the judges um, handing out the work and seeing that the case flow um, runs smoothly, he will then decide what judges to allocate the matter to. So who's busy with what? And he will give it to specific judges and if you said five days, then OK, you must keep to that five days more or less. And you will know that judge is now busy with that matter for five days in that. So if a matter has been allocated and you said the matter is going to run for five days and now a judge has been allocated a matter. has been allocated other matters that has been set up. Now you come and you say you're not ready because of X, Y and Z. Then that judge now sits with nothing. Another case could have been heard. So to avoid that, and because we have this continuous role, it's not that the judge has under matters for that day because they run a matter continuously until it's finished. Um, they only then allocate dates to matters that are certified ready where there was judicial oversight. And then, um, yeah, we don't waste anyone's time. There's a lack of judges and there are many matters on the roll so that only matters that deserve to be heard at already. Well, that's basically what happens in judicial case management. There's certain forms that you fill in when you apply for judicial case management. And then, yeah, you have to certify that the matter is ready. They look at the file actually in court and they say, OK, this matter is not ready or it is ready. Are there any questions? Right, then I've got That is Rule 37A that you can look at. Um, judicial evidence on commission. This is now another way to get evidence before the court. Remember in the beginning, I told you that the judge can only consider evidence. It can't consider anything but evidence. And the evidence must be given by witnesses, right? Um, if a witness is unwilling or unable to come to court, there is a way around that. Um, evidence on commission, you bring an application to have the evidence um, given in front of a commissioner. It can be taken in the Republic of South Africa or even outside. It's usually taken this way because it's convenient and necessary for the purpose of justice and the evidence must be relevant. Um, where the attendance of the witness cannot be enforced, the court will as a rule allow the evidence to be taken on commission unless it appears that the other side is likely to be prejudiced thereby or that a miscarriage of justice may result. The court may exercise its discretion not only on formal issues, but also on contentious issues, and it must be said that the evidence is material and that the person can't come. Maybe the person is on his deathbed, or maybe the person is overseas and don't want to travel to South Africa. And the evidence must be given. Now, um, having said this, this rule is there on our books. With COVID, we have now learned that we can be anywhere and still have court and still be in the presence of a judge. So a commissioner, in this case, a commissioner is appointed who takes the evidence and this cross-examination. The attorneys, the lawyers go there and they do the cross-examination and the examination in chief and all of that. And that evidence is then handed up and it forms part of the evidence that the judge is going to consider. That is the evidence on commission. That we now know that we have our court cases on Teams, we have court cases on Zoom, and um, people are all over the world and they participate in cases. So I don't know if this is still a necessity where you have to bring an application for evidence on commission. Or can you just bring an application to maybe um, have a witness be in another part of the world when he gives evidence? I think that I think that is coming at it's happening already. People are anywhere and then they they do that. Right, interrogatories is basically um, a specific, 
specific um, list of questions that is sent to a wood. Uh, commissioner, but it's just um, a list of questions and the answers are recorded and um, it's dealt with in terms of section 39 of the Superior Courts Act. It's not in terms of the rules. I'm just mentioning it here because we were speaking about evidence on commission. Right. Evidence on affidavit, that is um, in the court's discretion. Usually the court would allow evidence um, on affidavit to go in if it is not contentious, if it's formal evidence, and especially if there's not going to be any cross-examination on that evidence, then the court would allow, and also by agreement between the parties, um, they can allow for an affidavit. That, that is if you accept that evidence seem to be true and you're not going to challenge it. Um, on technical matters, in terms of the Civil Proceedings Evidence Act, evidence in affidavits are allowed. Right. Do I have any questions? None. Are, are you still with me? Good evening, Advocate. Yes. Yes, Jeffrey. Yes, OK, thank you, Jeffrey. Yes, but um, uh, can you please clarify me with this? Uh, I mean, the, 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 the use of this term, tender in, is it the same as to provide in or to hand in information? Just, just like, come again, Jeffrey. I, I didn't hear you quite well. What did you say? In page 136, uh, section 17.2. Say, of your notes? Yeah, 17.1, 17.2. Yes. 17 yes. yes. Plans, and photographs, and diagrams, yes. Yes, you say, be entitled in, to tender in evidence. So I want to know. Oh, give, give. Tender oh, means give. Okay, thank you. Hand in, tender, I uh, hand it in, or hand up. Yes. All right. Thanks. Okay, no problem. Right, any other questions? Okay, um, we now come to the pre-trial. Right. Now, this pre-trial conference is a conference between the parties. It's usually how that, yes, is, is there a question? Somebody's microphone is on. Uh, yes. Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, okay. Proceed. Yes. Uh, the, the other matter that you, you dealt with just before the, the last matter of, of, of evidence being, being, being collected from different places. Um, I'm not quite sure if I was following the concept or the idea behind the concept. Maybe you know, in, in two or three sentences, can you just explain what is the purpose of that? Thank you. Gibson is unwilling or unable to come and testify in court during the trial, right? Remember, you must place all the evidence that can help you to prove your case. Now, if one of your witnesses are unable to come to court or unwilling to come to court, that is a, a procedure that you can follow. You can apply to have the evidence on commission so that the commissioner is appointed that go, they will go to the witness. The attorneys will also go there. The court himself will not go there. Then they will do the questioning and the cross-examination. <coughs> it will be recorded and then it will be handed up and it becomes part of the record of the proceedings. Is that oh, the question I, that you asked? Yes, that, that's the question I was asking. Thank you. But then you've just read something very interesting to say the cross examination will take place during that very process. Mm. So it is it is somewhat um, a form of a pre trial. But just for people, at, 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 the evidence, it's to get the evidence because the person is unwilling or unable to come to court. Yes. Yeah, yes. Oh, okay. Uh, no, thank you very much, Advocate. Uh, thank okay. you. Okay. 
I, I also after that said that in today that now that we are using teams and that for court cases, I'm sure the court can be there and 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 um it can be done because that is how in in Houting especially we have been doing trials. It was online. Everybody was in different witnesses were in different locations, attorneys and lawyer um, advocates were in different locations and the court were in a different location, but they were all on this platform that we are on now and trials were run like that. So I'm saying uh, I think almost like that, that kind of procedure is superfluous because the court can now be anywhere. Do you understand? And they don't have to take it on commission, but it will be in the presence of the court virtually. But that is just my take on that. Yes, no, it's it's clear. Thank you. Thanks. Right. Um, yes, um, three, the bottom of oh. page uh, 206, what is, apologies, sorry, um, uh, section 52, if I'm not mistaken, can you just confirm on uh, uh, your previous slide, the bottom oh, part slide says section the... 52. Oh, sorry, what, this one? Sorry. That's so that one. Was it this one, ma'am? It's uh, your um the slide is clear, there's nothing on it. No, is the it next one. This one. Uh, where it speaks of the granting, this is it's clear still. It's there's nothing on it. It's, uh, twenty-five. Thank you. Oh, okay. section twenty-five. Okay. Sorry, sorry about that. Thank Pre you. Thank, thank you. Pre-trial conference. Um, in terms of rule thirty-seven, you hold a pre-trial conference at one of the party's um, rooms. Um, the attorney for the plaintiff would usually arrange for the pre-trial conference, but if he does not, the attorney for the defendant can arrange for the pre-trial conference. All the parties in the litigation or in the action must be represented. Right, and um, in the pre-trial conference, you're going to discuss certain aspects. Um, of the trial and you will find your um, agenda for the pre-trial conference. It will be in 37, I think at six. I'm just, I'm just saying, yeah. 37.6, which says that the minutes of the pre-trial conference shall be prepared and signed by or on behalf of every party, and the following shall appear therefrom. Now, all of these, A to, to K, all of that aspects must be discussed during the pre-trial conference. Um, I can do that. Let me just... If I can put on that. Okay. Oh, sorry, I've got a must change. Right, I don't, um, if you can see this, um, uh, this is rule 37, six, the minutes of the pre-trial conference shall be prepared and signed by on behalf of every party and the following shall appear there from. So this is what must be discussed during the pre-trial conference. The dates, place and the duration of the conference and the names of the parties present. If a party feels that such party is prejudiced because another party has not complied with the rules of court, the nature of such non-compliance and prejudice. That every party has requested such party opponent to make a settlement proposal and that the opponent has reacted thereto, whether any issue has been referred 
for mediation, arbitration, or a decision by a third party and the basis on which it has been so referred, whether the case should be transferred to another court, which issues should be decided separately. I'll still come to that. Issues decided separately. The admissions made by each party. Any dispute regarding the duty to begin or the owners of proof. Any agreement regarding the production of proof by way of an affidavit or whether evidence is required to be taken on commission or by way of audio visual link in terms of Rule 38. Which party will be responsible for the copying and other preparation of documents and which documents or copies of documents will without further proof serve as evidence of what they purport to be Tracks may be proved without proving the whole document or any other agreement regarding the proof of documents. And then the minutes must be filed no later than 25 days prior to the trial date. And if you're late with your minutes, then you lose your trial date. So they're very strict in compliance with this. OK, so all of that um, should be included in your pre-trial minutes. And um, the pre-trial minute is then signed by by the parties present and filed at court 25 days prior to the trial date. If it's late, you lose your test. And there's an example of pre-trial minutes on page 254 of your manual. 254, there is an example of a pre-trial minute. But if you ever should not know what must be discussed, these are the items for the agenda. This is what you're going to discuss. People have pro forma forms that they fill in during the pre-trial conference. Yeah, are there any questions on that? None. Right, this is just the purpose of it, to try and reach agreement on certain issues, usually of a more formal nature, which will eliminate the need to call certain witness and have the effect of shortening the duration of the trial and to conserve costs. It's also to agree on the procedural issues. Example, who has the onus of proof? Who has the duty to begin? Who will prepare the bundles? Who will separate? Are there going to be separation of the issues? And all this will um, enable the trial to run smoothly. It will avoid arguments in limine and then allow the parties to concentrate on the merits of the dispute. Right. Are there any questions? None. OK, then I will see you tomorrow evening. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Good night. Thank you. OK. Good night.
Oh. <laughs> 